Hari Om, everyone, and welcome back to Book Light 3, Part 3. <laughs> Today, we have something very special, something we've never done before, which is having our chicks speak. You know, normally we'll have different swamins and brahmacharyans come, and so this series is going to be very special because we want to be able to hear from the chicks directly. We saw the very first satsang by Brahmacharya Shupaniji. Then we had discussion, chick only, but good discussion nonetheless. And third, we had a uh, third. Now we have this presentation, and we have three chicks who are lined up today to speak. We'll do an invocation prayer, and then we'll get started. Om, 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 Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunatu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvinavadhita Mastumavit Vishavahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Samasta Janakalyane, Niratam Karunamayam, Namami Chinmayam Devam, Sadkurum Brahma Vitvaram. So, Vedo Nityamadhiyatam was the first instruction given. of how to live in a more healthy and intelligent way in 2021. This first line comes from Sadhana Panchakam, which Shubhanji already covered for us last time, a nice introduction. So what we'll do is, before jumping into these three speakers, we'll also chant the first verse in a lean and repeat format. So one of our chicks, will Sahana, will uh, repeat, and I'll chant the first verse for us. Ready, Sahana? Yes, ready, Amarji. Vedo nitya madhiyatam Vedo nitya madhiyatam Taduditam karma swanushtiyatam Taduditam karma swanushtiyatam Tene shasya vidhiyatam Tene shasya vidhiyatam Apachitihi kamyes matistya jatam. Apachitihi kamye matistya jatam. Papo gah paridhu yatam. Papo gah paridhu yatam. Bhava suke dosho nu sandhi yatam. Bhava suke dosho nu sandhi yatam. Atme chavya vasiyatam. Atme chavya vasiyatam. Nijagriha turnam vinir gum yatam. Nijagriha turnam vinir gum yatam. So, Vedo Nityamadhiyatam. First up to speak for us is going to be Dalmya. Dalmya is 23 and from our Alpharetta Center in Georgia. He's currently an SAP consultant and has been part of Balvihar since he was just six years old. You know, really brought up and born and bred through Chinmay Mission. Now he's currently a chick, active chick, taking part in book light and also various initiatives by uh, Vivekji in many of his courses. So without further ado, we'll hand it off now to Domia to talk tonight. Adiós, Domia. Hariyo. Om Shri Chinmaya Sadguru Venamaha Vedo Nitya Madhiyatam. So, purely from the English translation, Vedo Nitya Madhiyatam means to study the Vedas daily. Veda means knowledge. Knowledge is considered power, and without it, we tend to be lost in the ignorance of our ways. The Vedas are compiled into four texts the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda and the Atharva Veda. 
And in each text, there are four or five subsections, one of which contains the Upanishads, texts discussing meditation, philosophy, and spiritual knowledge. Traditionally, the Vedas were passed on orally from teachers to students. Bhagavan Ved Vyasa compiled this knowledge systematically and divided it into four texts, as I mentioned earlier. Later, Sri Adi Sankaracharya wrote Bhasya, meaning commentary on the Vedas. In Chinmaya mission tradition, we follow the lineage of Sri Sankaracharya and we study the Advait Vedanta, which means non-dualism, that Brahman alone is. Adiyatam is from the root Adhyayan, which means to study. Study can be done by various means, including reading, listening, and contemplating. In order to develop proper studying habits, one has to be completely focused on the task at hand. Nitya means perpetually or eternally. While the literal meaning in the text is given as daily, the use of nitya makes this much deeper. Studying should happen when you wake up, after you brush your teeth, before you start eating, and when you head to bed. In other words, you should always be reflecting on the material that you study. Bhagavan Krishna in Bhagavad Gita tells Arjuna that abhyasa, meaning discipline, is a very necessary quality for a seeker. Someone asked a question to Pujya Gurudev, how long should I meditate? And Gurudev responded that you should meditate 24-7. The Vedas are considered pramana, or a valid means of knowledge, for anything beyond means of senses and therefore are very sacred. The end portion of the Vedas are the Upanishads, which gives the essentials of Advaita Vedanta. From what we learned in discourse, we know that everything that prepares us for Upanishad, we should study. That particular text can give us clarity and purpose. How should we live our life is the question that all of us seekers are asking. The answer can be found by contemplating on the text. Relating to vision, Acharya Vivekji says that those who live by sight make their lives much smaller than it can be because they live by isms and separation, while those who live past their eyes live by vision. They use their intellect with a focus on unity. There was a blind Satan named Gulabrao Maharaj in Maharashtra who remembered all of the Vedas and Shastras at the age of 10 years old just by listening or shravanam. Sight is not the full picture and beauty is only in the eye of the beholder. It is said that the Vedas have come from something called the breath of God or aporesha, meaning revelations. They haven't been written by humans and therefore are free from defects such as biases, emotions, lack of death, and the interference of senses and distractions. An interesting thought I am contemplating on is when a chick from our group discussion last week shared that the Puranas deal with mysticism and that figures like Ganesha don't actually exist in the world, but that we should learn to keep our mind open. It is important to not only read, but also reflect and study on what we read, whether it is just reading after or after a period of time. Whatever we do study, we should only study it if we can understand it and reflect on it perpetually. Picking up a text for the purpose of external validation will do us no good. Another reflection I have been thinking about from a lecture is how the most interesting people are most interested in all that they do and to study every day means to have that interest. Have that interest in learning about yourself. Keep thinking about the Vedas in your own spiritual growth. After spending some time with the holy texts, I know now that I know now that my mind is the source of sorrow, not external objects. Supposing the season is winter, one person may feel that this is good because they enjoy the snow, but another may be really sad because it is cold outside. It's not the season itself that is causing this sorrow, it's the way their mind perceives it. This is why Shubhaniji conveyed that it is and has been incredibly important for us to stay inspired every day by keeping our mind in the texts studying and reflecting on them whenever we can. How do we know that we're inspired by a text? The message in them makes us want to change our life. Lately, I've been engaged in studying the text Drig Drishya Vivek in Acharya Vivekji's class. Through each verse, I have examined how to perform inquiry into the distinction between the seer, Drig, and the seen, Drishya. As I have found myself engaged in the reflection of the text every week, I've started to become more observant of everything happening around me. I disassociate more from the things that I use or was previously attached to, and I'm starting to see everything as more of an observer. It has brought me closer to Bhagavan because I realize that which I am aware of, I cannot be. 
So then why should I be sad when something of mine is broken or is taken away? I was never that thing or object, and so I should remain unaffected and in total equanimity. Another reason why Vedo Nityam Adiyatam is important to me is how it has reminded me that though we can get lost in life, staying grounded in the text can guide us. One text especially for me being Bhagavad Gita. Every day I've started to read a verse or two of the Gita, and I reflect on the questions that Arjuna has for Bhagavan Krishna that are questions we often ask ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis, but have not, not founded the answers for. We often turn to YouTube or self-help guides to seek inspiration, but for me, the best inspiration comes from the Gita. It tackles topics like attachment, love, fear, independence, topics that we can relate to, and I've been able to make the connection between what is taught and how I can apply it in my day-to-day -day life. Something that I've personally taken from the Bhagavad Gita is how I constantly need to remind myself that the finite aspects of the world will and are always changing, but my prakriti or my nature remains always infinite. In verse 15 of chapter 2, Bhagavan says that the firm man who is not afflicted by heat and cold and to whom pleasure and pain are the same is fit for realizing immortality of the self. So why should I fear the unborn future? Why should I mourn the dead past? This is why studying the Vedas daily is so important. To remain focused on being a better individual now and in this moment and study and reflect every day in the time that I've been given to become closer to Bhagavan and the oneness. By studying the Vedas daily and engaging in spiritual discussion and reflection, I have grown as a person and I felt what is most important to me has changed identifying closer to my true nature of independent joy. Hari Om. Harion Damio, nice job. <laughs> You're a guinea pig. You're our first one up. So thank you so much for volunteering um, and for your preparation. Next, we have our Heymanth. I say our Heymanth because he's part of our booklight team, <laughs> doing so much for us. A little bit about Heymanth. Heymanth is 27 and he's currently residing in San Francisco, part of the Chinmai Mission San Jose Center. Um, he's an avid sevak, always helping out for whether it be Mahasamadhi camp or teaching Balavihar. I think he's currently teaching 7th and 10th graders. And he's working as a software engineer. So now I'll hand it over to Hemant. Hari Om, Hemant. Hari Om, everyone. Um, pranams to Shivani Ji, Amarji, and everyone here. Om Shri Chinmaya Sadguruve Namah. <laughs> Domya, excellent speech. Um, and I hope that I do not repeat everything that was just said. So um, with that said, Vedo Nityam Adiyatam. Powerful message which says study the Vedas regularly. So much said in just one part of the first verse of Sadhana Panchakam. Study the Vedas regularly. So the first word, Vedas. Veda comes from the root vid, which means to know. So as Dhamma had already stated, Veda means knowledge. So Vedas do not have an author. So we see so many texts around this today. Everything is authored, but Vedas themselves don't have any author because they um, are eternal and they define everything. And since they were heard by ancient rishis, they are called Shrutis because Shruti means that which is heard. So Vedas are means of knowledge and means of knowledge always is to know about a particular thing. So in the case of the Vedas, the Vedas are means of knowledge to know about such questions like, for instance, how do I gain worldly prosperity? What is the purpose of my life? Who am I? And so Vedas are the means of knowledge to gain insight in these kinds of questions and many more. And at every stage, they will always say how to fulfill desires, how to go beyond desires, and how to eventually realize that supreme truth. So there are lots of different rituals in the Vedas, all meant for fulfilling certain desires, if done with Shraddha. However, the lighter portion of the Vedas insists that these same karmas turn into karma yoga so that mental impurities can be removed. So this portion of the Vedas, which deals with these kinds of rituals, is called the karma kanda portion. So another portion is upasanas, 
Upasanas, I would like to think of it as sadhana of bhakti, means devotion to the Supreme. And the Vedas give meditation on consciousness with attributes in order to reach higher worlds for greater happiness. And the later portion of the Vedas again insists that the true eternal happiness is what we all need to strive for. So, which leads me to talk about the last portion, Uttara Vimamsa, which is Jnana Kanda or the Upanishads. And as Dhamya has stated, the Upanishads are the essence of the entire Vedas. And Upanishads cover answers for deeper questions of life, like what is my true nature? What is the nature of the world? And it gives clarity to Jiva, Jagat, and Ishvara. And they declare that we are nothing but Brahman, but the universal self, but due to our own ignorance, we feel limited. This teaching, however, may definitely be difficult to comprehend. I know first time when I heard it, I was like, you, you gotta be kidding me. But it took me a long time for me to, you know, really wrap my head around that fact. But, but since this teaching may be difficult to comprehend, the ancient rishis have brought several compositions that cover the essence of the Vedas in much simpler ways. So study the Vedas regularly. How is that possible? So some of the compositions, like I mentioned um, earlier, that have been brought about, they include Tulsi Ramayana, Bhagavatam, then we have Bhagavad Gita. All are much simpler ways of expressing the higher truth, right? In fact, Bhagavad Gita is the essence of the Upanishad. So you could say that it is the essence of the essence of the Vedas. Nityam Adiyatam. How do you study daily? So it's not so much quantity which matters. Like it is far better to take one idea and keep that as our companion and practice it regularly rather than trying to multitask, trying to do multiple different things and not doing them regularly. And that idea should always remind me what my goal is. And why study the Vedas? Because it should bring about alert, conscious living. And for alert living, we need to make choices consciously based on our understanding. And the Vedas give a very good roadmap for alert living. So eventually what happens as a result of studying the Vedas regularly? Be inspired at all moments by the larger vision of the higher essence of life. So for me personally, all parts of the Vedas definitely resonate, but one part definitely resonates with me and that is how to recognize the Supreme in my life. I have lost count of the number of times I've heard about the Supreme and it's always been delivered in the most beautiful way possible. And I may, feel that I understand the presence of Bhagavan, the Supreme, intellectually in everything I perceive and in my actions, but I'm not sure if I actually fully understand even now. So I started recognizing the sadhana of devotion in many ways. And one way that really inspires me for probably 20 plus years or so is while I chant Hanuman Chalisa. So the thing about Hanuman Chalisa that is so special to me is that um, my parents have told me that even before I started speaking proper words, that I actually used to sing the Hanuman Chalisa tune. And even though it was rather garbled and not proper, um, I was humming it. So Hanuman Chalisa has stuck with me for my entire life. And it's really no surprise that Hanumanji is my Ishta Devata or my favorite Devata, the one that really, really inspires me. So recognizing Bhagavan's nature in everything I do, and I get that by chanting Hanuman Chalisa every single day. And every time I chant it, I continuously feel inspired. So, and there is another practice that I do every night, which is called Likita Japa which is an open eye meditation to remember Bhagavan by writing his name continuously. So in my case, I write Om Ham Hanumate Namaha every single night in order to inspire me. So regularity in this pursuit is helping me to be single pointed and I am enjoying bhajans, stotrams and kirtans. As some of you know, I, I just love singing like 
And that, again, is my way of expressing my love for Bhagavan, love for the higher. So um, that's another sadhana that I try to do every single day. Um, and like Dhaumya, I've also tried to read Bhagavad Gita verse daily because um, Bhagavad Gita, I like to think that I resonate a lot with Arjun. Um, you know, a lot of the questions that he's asking Bhagavan are questions that I would ask myself. And I also heard, you know, that don't think of Bhagavad Gita as only Krishna addressing Arjuna. No, it's all, it's really Krishna addressing all of us, right? The context is, yes, it may take place on a battlefield, but actually it's no matter where we are, Krishna is addressing all of us to do our dharma, to do our duty diligently. So um, I try to take up the practice of reading Bhagavad Gita along with Puja Gurudev's amazing commentary every single night, reflecting on it and trying to live it as, as well as I can. And reflecting on even one verse is, has proven to shatter some of my wrong beliefs it helps me to recognize the higher self, helps me to have the right attitude, and especially during adverse situations. And I can think of no better example than during the pandemic, because when, you know, I am at home and not, you know, finding ways to enjoy satsang, I found no lack of Bhagavad Gita lectures. And I'd like to think that Bhagavad Gita has definitely helped me a lot during this uh, pandemic time to make choices with more clarity, to make the right choices, and definitely uh, remind me of all the positive things that I have in my life. So um, I may be far from realizing that supreme truth, but I am very, very certain that every bit of sadhana based on the scriptures will not fail. And I will say this with clarity, that every bit of sadhana based on the scriptures that I have tried has worked, is working, and will work. I have no doubt about it whatsoever. I'm 100% confident. I say this with utmost confidence that whatever sadhana I am doing is working right now and will continue to work. So what really helps me to take up just a few sadhanas and practice regularly is the fact that this is delivered with so much love by the Guru Parampara and I elaborate that I only take up a few sadhanas and not multiple, so that's really helped me out. Um, and it's just so inspiring to me that Adi Shankaracharya has so lovingly written sadhana panchakam for all of us with such precision so that we can elevate ourselves throughout life in pursuit of real happiness. So I guess to really close off, I'm going to just say that I'm filled with such gratitude towards Adi Shankaracharya towards Puja Gurudev, to the entire Guru Parampara. And honestly, it's because of Gurudev that I've grown as a person because without him, we probably would not be here. I would not have gotten the chance to read so many amazing scriptures. And I don't know what my life would be like. And I have met the most amazing people possible throughout mission. And I'm part of amazing study groups where we reflect on all the different different scriptural messages so i have no words to express my gratitude so with that said i hope that i can continue to do justice to my sadhana i hope that i can continue to uh, serve as best as i can and my utmost pranams to puja gurudev puja guruji the guru parampara um and all the wonderful Brahm Brahmacharians and Swamins of the mission who have helped me grow as a person. To all of you, my, my humble gratitude. I hope that I can continue to do my best. Hariyam. Hariyam, Heman. Thank you so much for sharing. It was really, really beautiful. Our last speaker for tonight will be Soumya. Soumya is uh, currently a senior at University of Michigan and living uh, with her parents in Northville, uh, Michigan. Uh, I believe you're studying uh, neuroscience. Um, what else? Soumya is also a very active uh, chick participant, being part of uh, Vivek Ji's classes, 
as well as Chinmay Mission uh, and Armor, which is uh, Avantika, and also Booklight. So Somya, we'll hand it off to you now to cap us off for the evening. Also, one more note, sorry, I just realized. If you have any questions, I'm sure, you know, some of these talks have given you some questions. Open fire at the end. <laughs> All three will be ready to answer your questions. So please, if you have any questions, send them over to me via chat. If you're joining us on Facebook, join us on Zoom. You can send in your questions. Let me know who you're addressing it to and we'll ask your questions. Harion, Samia, go ahead. Thank you so much, Amarji, and thank you to the entire Booklight team for this wonderful opportunity. Um, so begin. Om Shri Chinmaya Sadguru Venamaha. So as we've heard already, Vedo Nitya Madhiyatam, study the Vedas daily. And from Dhaumya and Hemant's uh, messages, we've heard the meaning of this line. We've heard some examples of sadhanas that we can practice in our own lives. I wanted to close off just by talking a little bit about how we can take this advice. You know, the first piece of advice Sri Adi Shankaracharya gives in his last instruction to his disciples, how do we make this practical to our own lives? And specifically, I want to address three main questions. So these are, who is this advice meant for? What exactly are we supposed to study? And finally, how or with what attitude are we supposed to study this? So regarding the first question of who this advice is intended for, in the first few verses of Tattva Bodha, it's described the qualities that are required for a person to be fit to study the Vedas. And so this metric or rubric is given. It's called the sadhana chatushtaya, or the four qualifications. And these are the capacity to discriminate between the permanent and the impermanent, or viveka, dispassion towards the fruits of our actions, or vairagya, a group of six wealths uh, called the samadhi shataka sampatti, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then finally, a desire for liberation, or mumukshutva. So these are the four qualifications that are laid out. And uh, to elaborate a little bit more on the samadhi shataka sampatti, these are our sixfold wealth. So these are control of the mind, known as shama, control of the senses or dhamma, withdrawal of the mind and strict observance of one's own duty, which is uparama, and endurance, titiksha, and faith, shraddha, and focus, samadhana. So uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you have found this as well, that when you're trying to embark on a difficult task, it's really nice to have um, some sort of checklist or some sort of a guide for how to get to that difficult goal that you're trying to have. And so the fact that this rubric has been laid out for us is a really nice roadmap to how we can make ourselves fit for this, this difficult study of the Vedas. So I encourage all of you to focus on maybe just two of these qualities that are most applicable to you. And I did this exercise myself. And so uh, two of these qualities that I think um, I want to focus on uh, in the most immediate future are shama, control of the mind, and samadhana, so focus on, on that ultimate goal and that um, ultimate reality. Um, and I think these are, uh, you know, as we've talked about the difficulties of this past year, it's, um, to me, these qualities are really important um, given all the distractions and the difficulties that uh, we've been facing as a world and as a society. So why should we qual cultivate these qualities of fitness in the first place, right? This is a lifelong process. It's difficult to do. Why should we um, embark on, on purifying our mind like this? So chapter four in verse 10 of the Gita, I'll just read the, the um, English translation by, by Gurudev. Um, but it reads, freed from attachment, fear and anger, absorbed in me, taking refuge in me, Purified by the fire of knowledge, many have attained my being. Um, and of course, the, the poetic words of Bhagavad Gita, the poetic words that uh, Swami Chinmayananda has so graciously um, bestowed on all of us, um, that, that line of being purifi purified by the fire of knowledge, I think is something that I personally find to be very inspirational. 
Um, and I, I want to be prepared to um, experience that purification through knowledge. Um, so I, I hope you find that uh, as, a, as a source of inspiration too, for why we should cultivate these qualities to be ready to study this, this Veda. And which brings us to the next question. So we, we've studied the qualities that we should develop to be fit to study the Vedas. But then the question comes up, what exactly should we study? You know, um, the Vedas are, are such an infinite source of knowledge. Shivani Ji shared with us during the lecture the importance of, of focusing in on Vedanta and the study of the philosophy. And uh, that certainly helps us get a better grasp on, on what we should be focusing our attention on. But I think um, there's also a kind of an overwhelming sense of the depth of every single word in the Vedas. And it makes me think of a story that Swami Sarupananji shares in his Gayatri uh, Mantra lectures. So the story goes something like this. The Devatas realize that knowledge is power. And they're trying to keep this balance of, of good um, triumphing over evil in the universe. And so they go to Brahmaji and they say, you have the knowledge of this entire universe. How do we acquire this knowledge? So Brahmaji reveals to the Devatas all of the mantras of the Vedas uh, and the three forms of the Rig, Yaju, and Samavedas. And for thousands and millions of years, the Devatas try to memorize and understand these mantras and uh, really dedicate themselves to this. Finally, they return to Ramaji and say, this is too much. Can you make it easier for us? So Ramaji says, okay. He gives them three lines. These are the lines, Tatsavidurvarenyam, Bhargo Deva Siddhimahi, Dhyo Yona Prachodayat. These are the three lines found in Gayatri Mantra. And uh, the devatas go back and they meditate on these lines as well. Just these three simple lines, they meditate on them for thousands and thousands of years. But they still can't grasp the vastness and the knowledge that's contained within these three lines. Finally, they return back to Brahmaji. And this time, Brahmaji gives them three vyavritti, or mystical sound symbols. And so these are bhu, bhuva, and suva. And, uh, you know, that's the beginning of Gayatri Mantra, Bhubhuva Swaha. And many years, the, the Devatas meditate on these three sounds. Still, this is too much to comprehend. Finally, from the entire Veda, Brahmaji pulls out one word with three syllables or sounds. And this is A, U, M, or Om. So, why, why am I sharing this story with all of you, right? One of the questions that Amarji had asked us during our reflection session with the, the chicks is, have we ever studied a text? And I think uh, all of us have had the experience of, of finding some um, texts that we've uh, had the opportunity of listening to teachings on or reflect on, our, reflect on ourselves. Um, but I think this story I want to convey to you to think about even the entire Vedas being contained in this one single word with which we begin all of our readings and prayers. And so if we can take a minute to reflect on the depth of that single word, how much could we extract, how much knowledge and wisdom could we extract from everything it is that we're, we're studying and trying to learn from? Finally, how should we study daily? With what attitude should we be approaching this entire process? So one of the teachings uh, I've heard frequently is to know something, we must live it, right? So uh, Swami Jinmayananda tells us that truthfulness or satyam is a prerequisite for every seeker. So uh, in chapter seven of self-enfoldment, it said that we must be ready to consider and reconsider an ideal for a thousand times if necessary and in the light of all the evidence available to accept it or reject it. But once we accept an ideal as ours, we must discover in, us, our, in ourselves the heroism to live up to it at all times. Because when we compromise our convictions, we form a split personality, becoming cowardly in the face of further challenges in life. So 
I think that is really the core of, of understanding um, this message that Adi Shankaracharya leaves us with. Study the Vedas daily, Vedo Nityam Adiyatam, and we're studying it with a, a deep conviction of trying to make this our, our daily lives and our reality, right? This is not something that we can just read and, and let go of. It's something that we have to really dedicate ourselves towards. Um, so if there's three kind of key messages that I think we can all um, reflect on maybe is one, to invest in the process of making our mind fit for the study of Vedas. Two, continually reflect on the depth of each single word of Vedantic teachings. And three, commit to a lifestyle of satyam, integrating what we study into the life we lead. Thank you. Hariyo. Hariyam Samia, also beautiful. All three of you did so good. So on Zoom, everyone just give a round of applause. <laughs> oh, um, these three all volunteered. All right, they were not voluntold. They all volunteered, and the fact that you all went so deep really followed the instructions of Shubhaniji when we first started out. Right, we can study all these texts and you know memorize verses, etc. But for us to go truly deep is where it's at, right? So I loved how all three of them were referencing different classes that they were a part of or different texts, you know, all from just a few words. This very first half of one pada of Sadhana Panchika. Now we'll move on to Q&A. So if any of you have any questions, doubts, uh, et cetera, um, please, ask. We would love to hear your thoughts asking them. Um, let's see, do we have any yet? Don't believe we have any yet in the chat. So please send them in the chat. Um, but to kick us off, I'll ask one question to Hemant. So Hariyal Hemant, one question for you. You made one statement at the end, which I want you to just elaborate a little bit more on saying that your sadhana is working. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Because sometimes we'll sit there and do, you know, one mala, two malas, 10 malas of japa, and our mind is not settling down. Can you explain that a little bit more? Hey, Mat. Yeah, um, I had a little bit of trouble unmuting my dad. So yeah, I'll elaborate. Um, when I say my sadhana was to work, maybe I should have clarified. I um, I am not 100% successful at this, but um, since I've studied the idea of karma yoga, I basically try to um, apply all my work um, in that spirit of karma yoga, basically uh, to dedicate my work to the hires. Like, because my profession, you know, being an engineer, you know, it's um, I just want to, you know, think that I dedicate that work and everything else I do to, to for Bhagwan, right? So in that sense, that is that is basically the goal of all my sadhanas, really, regardless of whether it's Likita Japa chanting or reading Bhagavad Gita or even in my day-to-day -day job, I just want to do everything in the spirit of Karma Yoga. Does that answer, Amarji? Sure. I, I mean, um, Yes, <laughs> that is one way to answer. Um, next, we have a question from Ashika. Uh, Ashika is asking all three of you, could you all list quickly the very first sadhana that you decided to take up and why that particular sadhana? So we'll start with uh, Dalmia first, then Heyman, then Samia. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So sadhana, sadhana means practice, right? Um, means the means to which you can achieve something. Okay, means. Um, I would say the first thing I did was 
um, attend discourses um, and lectures by Acharya Vivekji. So I would say like last year, this time, I wasn't part of any Chick group. I was I was part of Chick Houston a little bit um, last year when I was living in Houston, but now I'm not in Houston and back in Georgia. So I, I was part of the Chick group of there a little bit, but now since last summer, I have been part of a lot of the uh, lectures that Vivekji gives. So um, I've been trying to attend his courses. Um, and then on top of that, I've been trying to follow and start reading some of the books, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Drigdar Shivavek. So um, it's kind of just trickled down from there. Cool. Hey, man. Um, good to tell, I'm not fully certain what my first sadhana was, but um, if I had to take a um, if I had to answer, like, in particular, what, like, one of my first sadhanas was, perhaps, then I'd probably say chanting Hanuman Chalisa. Um, like I mentioned, it's, it's just been a part of my entire life. So as long as I can remember before I started really attending discourses, before I started really delving into Bhagavad Gita meaning, um, I just, I loved chanting Hanuman Chalisa and, uh, I also love chanting. I also love singing bhajans and other stotrams too in general. So yeah, maybe to boil it down, maybe I'll just say, yeah, chanting and singing. And finally, Somya. Yeah, I, I think I'd have to agree with Hemant here as well. I mean, uh, through through the grace of, of both in my mission and uh, my family, I've been really fortunate to be surrounded by kind of encouragement and examples of people practicing and engaging in sadhana regularly. And so probably the very first thing was just um, saying the, the daily prayers, saying um, chanting and uh, Bhagavad Gita competitions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I can say one of the sadhanas right now that I um, I'm really investing in and uh, find really um, is is helping me grow is uh, spending some time daily for contemplation. So it's, it's one of the ones that I enjoy very much. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Looks like there's not many questions, which is lucky for you all. All right. Lucky for all of you. <laughs> Um, Shubhaniji, any questions um, that you want to ask? No. Okay. Then I think we'll also open it up um, outside of just these three. If anyone has questions for Shubhaniji. Don't worry. I'm not just putting Shubhaniji on the spot. We, we, we talked about this beforehand. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions for Shupani Ji, I know we didn't get to that last time. Uh, feel also free to ask. Good. <laughs> Means that it's been well cooked. We, we, we've, we've gone through this thing properly. Um, if anything comes up, I think we have a little bit of time left. Um, I think there, um, Amarji, there's two questions. So I'll oh, okay. Answer. Nothing's come through on, on my end. Okay, go. <laughs> okay. So first question was, or is, what was your first satana? Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about the very, very first, it will also be like most prayer. Uh, ever since I was a child, luckily I was in Balvihar. So we learned all of the prayers, daily prayers, and being able to talk to God. So that was my first sadhana. The next question is, what is the power and meaning of Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha? That is very deep, but I will tell you. Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha is a mantra. Hmm? And the power of this mantra is, first of all, Om. And uh, as Somya beautifully said, you know, everything is encapsulated in that one word, Om. 
And uh, Guruji always says, if we study one word well, we really don't need anything else. So Ganapati, Ganapati is the Lord Pati of the Ganas. So Ganas, you know, when we see the Lord Ganesha, the Ganas are like the army of Lord Shiva. Hmm? And Pati is that you, you are the Lord of that army. But really the Ganas are our senses. Huh? The Ganas are our senses and the Pati of the Ganas or the Lord of the senses is the intellect. So Ganapati means you are my intellect. You are that sattvic intellect. But not only that, gum is the seed, the bija. So Om Gam Ganapati. Ganapati, you are the intellect. But not only that, you are Om. Om means pure consciousness. That consciousness which is there in A, ah, waking. U, dream. M, deep sleep. That consciousness which is there, changeless, it's constant. During those three states, that is called Om. And so in A, ah, you're recognizing the consciousness in waking state. Ooh, dream state, mm, deep sleep state. And after that, there's just a silence. That silence is the true nature of Om. So Ganapati, you, you're, you are my sattvic intellect. And, but your real nature is Om. And to that Ganapati, Namaha, I completely surrender to you. Completely surrender to you means, Oh Ganapati, I don't have my own agenda. I don't have my own desire, my own like, my own will. I surrender my entire life to your hands because you are the sattvic intellect. You are the sattvic mind. Your power is much greater than mine. So is your strength and so is your knowledge. Therefore, O Ganapati, I surrender my entire being to you. And I know that you will take me to home. And this is the meaning of home, gum, Ganapati Namaha. Hmm? Right? Okay. Uh, there is another question. Is there a verse talking about the four defects of man-made texts? Where is it from? So it is from our notes. I don't know if it's in a particular text, but you can check it or I can send it to Vaibhav and then he can share it with all of you so that you will have a copy of it. Okay? All right. I think that's all the, the questions that are there from my side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Shubhaniji, I think what we'll do now is um, I'll put up the flyer for next uh, class and then I'll hand it over to Shubhaniji to conclude. Sure. All right. So our next session will be uh, Monday and we'll be taking the next half of that first bada. And we'll be meeting back on Monday, same time, the 15th. And the topic will be diligent duties and daily sadhana. All right. <laughs> awesome. So now we'll hand it over to Shubhaniji to conclude. So Hariyum to everyone and Dhaumya and Hemant and Somya. Really, really wonderful to listen to all of you. And it's so inspiring to hear your thoughts and to hear how the most inspiring thing is your own process of growth, your own evolution. And I think a lot of people also appreciate that or seeing that in chat. So next week, we will continue with Sadhana Panchaka, the second part of the verse. Karma Swanushti Yata. So we hope to see everyone there. And uh, we will say the closing prayer. And then we will see you then. Om. Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om Hari Om everyone, see you next week. <laughs>